Good evening and welcome to Catholic Theological Union. I am Ferdinand O'Correa, the Vice President and Academic Dean here at Catholic Theological Union. It is my distinct honor to warmly welcome you to this virtual gathering and presentation. For those who are new to our institution, three religious communities of men in our Roman Catholic tradition are the founders of CTU in 1968 in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, which issued the groundbreaking document Nostra Aetate, the declaration on the relation of the church with non-Christian religions. Since our foundation, CTU has been very committed to interreligious dialogue, especially through our Catholic Jewish studies and Catholic Muslim studies programs. In 2001, CTU established a chair in Jewish studies made possible by a most generous gift of Lester and Rene Crown and Patrick and Sheila Ryan. The chair has been held since 2014 by Professor Mark Ashinkovich, who also directs the Catholic Jewish Study Program at Catholic Theological Union. Today, there are 23 religious communities of men who are corporate owners of CTU, and their students make up about 40% of our student body. Another 20% are women religious, and the other 40% are laymen and women. All our students are preparing together for varieties of ministry in our church. Our mission is to prepare effective leaders for the church ready to witness to the good news of God's justice, love, and peace. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you will continue to participate in our programs please see our website, ctu.edu, for programs, courses, and upcoming events. And now I invite Professor Mark Ashinkovich to introduce our esteemed guest speaker. Thank you, Ferdinand, and thank you to all of you who made the time to attend this evening's event. Before I introduce Menachem, I want to say a couple words about how this event came about. As a literary historian, I've come to realize that most of us learn about other societies through encounters with images and objects, and not, sadly for me, through the study of ancient literature. Someone who is not Jewish or who knows very little about Jews and how they read and interpret their scriptures will probably be able to identify a menorah sitting on a shelf at Walgreens or a Star of David around a stranger's neck. The same goes for Jews, many of whom can tell you all about their neighbor's Easter egg hunt or their beautiful Christmas tree. Thousands of ordinary people might encounter the same menorah or the same Christmas tree in a single day and take the memory of that object with them as they continue to think about the religion or the culture that it is said to represent. The social impact of seeing everyday objects is far more profound, I think, than the impact of most texts. Museums occupy a privileged space in discourse about cultural objects. These institutions present themselves as scientific conservators of history that objectively introduce the public to various cultures and enrich the public's understanding of their origins. The perception of neutrality authorizes these museums to shape how people think about societies that they have not personally encountered. And yet, as we'll see this evening, some of these institutions do not always represent Jews and Christians in a way that aligns with Jewish and Christian self-understanding. Menachem Wecker has done more work than any other journalist, I think, to address the question of how museums throughout the world present material culture pertaining to Judaism and Christianity. As a journalist who works at the nexus of art and religion, Menachem is an acute observer of how material culture is used and his writing style sets the bar 
for mesmerizing storytelling. And if you haven't looked up his many, many articles online, please do so after this talk, just to uh, experience a masterclass in outstanding writing. Menachem is a freelance journalist in the Washington DC area who holds a master's in art history from George Washington University. He covers art, religion, chess, and culture. And he is the former education reporter at US News and World Report and a former member of the National Press Club Board of Governors. Menachem has interviewed Mel Brooks about Herring and has covered everything from Zoroastrian dating to the production of Trivia Night questions. We will leave time for discussion at the end of Menachem's talk, but feel free to use the chat box throughout the hour and insert your comments and questions. And I'll bring some of these to Menachem's attention or he'll respond to them directly throughout the lecture. After the lecture, we'll invite you to join us for a Q&A where participants can use the hand raise feature to make further comments. And now without further ado, please join me in welcoming Menachem Wecker. Thank you so much. Um, is everybody able to see the slides? Yeah, okay, um, great. Um, looking over the list of, of people who are here, thank you all for coming. I recognize a lot of the names and it's great to meet um, all those of you um, who I don't recognize. Um, welcome also to whoever will, will see this uh, recording later on. Um, starting off with a, a painting of, um, of Macbeth, because I wanna think about this talk kind of as a Shakespearean tragedy. And, and from everything I remember from my undergraduate litera uh, literature degree, um, a tragic hero is supposed to like, we're supposed to sing their praises first and then we, we talk about uh, the problem. So I wanna first start off with the good, um, this is going to be kind of a, a play in eight scenes, as you'll see. We're going to cover a hundred slides, but I, I hope it'll go faster than than it seems. Um, and so, um, for starters, the American Alliance of Museums, which is kind of the trade organization for museums, has a lot to say about, if it does say so itself, about how important museums are. You can look over some of the statistics here about the number of jobs created, the amount of money. Uh, generated museums uh, uh, employ a lot of people, they reach a lot of people. And you'll see here museums, if the again, if the trade association does say so itself, are very trusted, more trusted than I am as a journalist, more trusted than many of you are as, as scholars, um, more trusted than any number of other um, people. Um, a lot of these stat stats um, are pre-pandemic, some of this might be impacted, uh, by the pandemic, but um, but for the most part, this is what uh, museums have to say about themselves. And I want to try to push back a bit, a, 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 a bit um, here. I'll say also, just on a personal note, you'll see from some of these slides, I spend a lot of my time in museums. I love museums. It it's not easy for me to to point out a lot of the missteps. Um, but this is the nature of a tragic hero. Um, one other thing I want you to to keep in the back of your mind is that we've heard a lot about words and speech being incitement. And, and if pictures are worth a thousand words, let's just remember that pictures can involve quite a lot of incitement and violence. And I'm not gonna suggest that museums are anywhere near this kind of rogues gallery that Ar Arthur Schick represents here, but, but still there's, you know, we're gonna see a lot, of, um, a lot of issues. So first scene, scene one, which I'm calling museum, museum on the wall. Uh, the idea of museums as mirror, this is something that comes up a lot. Um, it comes up, it came up quite a bit. I covered um, the unveiling of the portraits of former president and first lady uh, Obama at the um, National Portrait Gallery and Smithsonian American Art Museum. And there's quite a lot of talk from uh, Amy Sherald who made the painting of Michelle Obama about the importance for black children to see people who look like themselves depicted in the, the paintings on the walls. Um, she's given a lot of interviews including to Artnet, where she talks about having grown up studying European painting um, and that being inadequate um, and, and all. And so I, I want us to keep in the back of our head what, you know, what this means to see oneself represented on the wall. The implication of some of this is that um, someone like I, as a kid going to museums, seeing a lot of white faces on the wall and seeing myself reflected, as we'll see in a second, um, it's a lot more um, complicated than that. We're gonna get at the question which I think museums are uniquely equipped to address about whether Jews are white and a whole bunch of, of other questions as we'll see. Um, 
there's been a lot of research on, on this. It's not just artists giving interviews to the press. This is one of many studies from 2021. And I thought it made a really good point that seeing oneself represented on museum walls, if all of the figures are wearing shackles and chains is not the kind of representation that we're talking about. So this is another thing I'd like us to keep in the back of my mind. Okay, scene two. Um, can museums make a difference? Can they save us from a car? Do they want to save us from a car? And, and as we'll see also, are some cars perhaps more equal than others? Um, so I want to start with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, which I spent a lot of my childhood, I grew up there in a lot of ways. This was an exhibit 2015 to 2016 called Class Distinctions. It addressed Dutch painting in the age of Rembrandt and Vermeer. There was work by Rembrandt and Vermeer and many others. And at the end of the show, there was a statement from curator which encouraged us to think about Occupy Wall Street. Obviously, Occupy Wall Street um, took place quite a few centuries after Rembrandt, but this was a thought that an exhibit called Class Distinction, we should think about Occupy Wall Street. Across the street at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, a 2021 to 2022 show of Titian uh, called Woman, Myth, and Power encouraged us to think about Me Too because sexual assault was depicted in the mythological uh, scenes. Um, at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, nearby here, a Degas exhibit in 2020 called Degas at the Opera encouraged us to think about Me Too. You'll see here a painting where we are told to take note of the men who are sponsors of the opera and the ballet who have privileged uh, ability to kind of, as we're told, to lurk um, during practices and to prey upon the dancers. Um, a label here, put that out. I don't know if you can see, can you see my pointer as I move it around somewhat? So, you know, looking over here where the arrows are, these subscribers lurk, they're wealthy and powerful, they're allowed backstage and they prey upon the young ballerinas. The exhibit did not tell us anything about the nature of that praying. It didn't sustain that. We were just told there's these men who are who are there, unclear what kind of culpability the opera had in allowing this, unclear if Degas himself is lurking in his, um, in his paintings um, and the like. The exhibit, interestingly, did not tell us at all that there is a very credible reason to believe that Degas raped a woman when he was younger. He seems to have admitted to it and apologized in a letter that wasn't addressed at all. And as we'll see in a second, Degas' anti-Semitism was not seen as significant, but this show of Degas and the opera, um, we were as, as viewers, we were encouraged to think about Me Too. At the National Gallery, um, as well, an exhibit, I don't have the year on this, uh, I forgot to put it down, it was probably last year or the year before, an exhibit of 17th century Dutch landscapes, we were told about the slave trade. Interestingly, an exhibit of 17th century Dutch seascapes at the National Gallery a few years prior, was heavily criticized in the Washington Post for not talking about slavery, and this was perhaps a corrective to that. But looking at paintings of, um, of, of seascapes, that's what we were encouraged to think about. Okay, in Toronto at the Art Gallery of Ontario, we have a Pissarro painting and a Monet painting. Let's remember Pissarro's name, that's gonna be relevant in a bit, Camille Pissarro, but here we're told Pissarro saw the scene as a celebration of the progress, but he was unaware of the pollution. Monet's has pollution ever looked so beautiful. So here are two, Impressionist paintings, and we're told, let's think about the environment. This is relevant context. Um, remaining in Toronto at the Art Gallery of Ontario, we're told again to think about slavery in light of a 17th century Belgian painting. And here is a 16th century, also 17th century Belgian painting, Christ at the Pool of Bethesda. And we're told about how water has been associated with healing and escape throughout history across the globe and in African American uh, spirituality, a song sung in 1850. So here is a, a song 200 years after the painting, but the, the museum is telling us while you're thinking about this Christian uh, painting in Belgium in, in the 17th century, let's think about, uh, about this song. Okay. Same museum, Art Gallery of Ontario has a um, around 1500 expulsion of the money changers. Interestingly, as I've blown up for you here, the money change, this story takes place in a sacred temple in Jerusalem not the Jewish temple, the so there must have been one of many sacred temples in Jerusalem. The figures are not identified as Jews, despite the story here being at times associated with anti-Semitism. We can see some Hebrew letters. If you can see my cursor on the sleeve of this fellow here, those are meant to be Olives. We'll see Hebrew is not always rendered correctly or it's not always a sensical inscription, um, but that's the situation. At the National Gallery of Prague, which is in the former Convent of St. Agnes. We have 
uh, St. Barbara being beheaded by a man. Yep, you guessed it with Hebrew on his sleeve. Now there are people here I'm sure who know way more about the story of St. Barbara and its interpretation than I. My recollection is that there might've been paganism you know, involved in, in this. I do not ever remember this being a death that was attributed to Jews. There certainly have been plenty of those uh, throughout history and I don't know if we need to add others, but for some reason, there's at least an Aleph here and some of these other letters um, look to be pseudo Hebrew, which happens a lot, maybe some of them approximations of, um, of Greek. In case you don't believe me about the Hebrew, here's two other paintings by the same artist. Uh, you can see the labels here. We have Hebrew letters here, Hebrew letters here. We have Hebrew on the titulus on the cross here, which is not exactly correct, but I don't know, maybe it's 70% correct. We have Hebrew here, also kind of mostly nonsensical on a hat. So here's an artist who puts Hebrew on clothing, um, even if he doesn't necessarily understand what he's putting there. Um, okay. Now I wanna to return to, um, to Degas, that show at the National Gallery. This is one of countless examples I could bring from Theodore Reff's new three volume translation of a lot of Degas letters that had been translated before. This is Degas writing to a fellow anti-Semitic friend about ostensibly a third friend, a retired military officer, Edward Lippmann. And I pointed out a couple of things here, I'll just read it to you. Um, so he's gone, the poor wandering Jew, Lippmann had just died. He will no longer be walking, and if we had been forewarned, we would have walked a little behind him. What did he think since the dirty affair began? That's the Dreyfus affair. What did he think of the awkwardness one felt with him in spite of oneself? Dot, dot, dot. Um, what was going on in his old Israelite head? Did he even think back to the time when we more or less overlooked his terrible race? So Degas would beg to differ with the chart, with the assumption, I suppose, that Jews are white. This is somebody of a different race. And, um, and as we'll see later on, anti-Semitism um, by a lot of accounts is on the rise. So what does it mean that the National Gallery thought that, you know, a, a problem that needs to be addressed, me too, was something that the show should tackle, but anti-Semitism was something to ignore. Another show at MFA Boston, this one is a Hyman Bloom show called Matters of Life and Death. It ran from 2019 to 2020. You can see here a painting by Bloom, note the date, 1945, older Jew with Torah. The label tells us that the rabbi is burdened by the scriptures. I would say he's burdened by the Holocaust also. There's a lot of paintings that Bloom made of the Holocaust. This was not in the exhibit. This was a few rooms removed from the exhibit. Note at the bottom, it tells you to learn more about him in the exhibit. I would humbly submit, like, what could be more a matter of life or death to a Jewish artist who makes a lot of paintings of the Holocaust than the Holocaust? And to not mention that in the show at all, to me, is shocking. Here's the entry, when you came into the show, here was the lead label, which doesn't tell you that Bloom was Jewish. Maybe some people would guess from Hyman, but we're told he's born in Latvia. It's later on in the show when you have a chandelier from a synagogue and a Christmas tree that the labels note that, um, that he was Jewish. It certainly was not uh, front and center. And we're gonna see a little later, people don't tend to read labels a whole lot. So let's remember that. Elsewhere in the MFA is what I would say is a very good label. I visited this is the newly renovated Italian gallery as I visited before they'd actually, it was so new that the label wasn't done. I assume it's still the same label, but it tells us who's missing in the gallery and it's worth taking a quick look at. I'm gonna take a sip of tea for a sec if you wanna take a look, but I think this is an example of a very good uh, label. So things are definitely complicated in the museums, but this tells us who's not being represented, who's not being depicted. Um, okay, let's go across town to the Harvard Fog Museum. We have on the left a painting circa 1500, um, Master of the Catholic Kings, that was, would be the, that would be Ferdinand and Isabella who expelled the Jews eight years prior. Um, we have a presentation in the temple. Luckily it tells us it's the Jewish temple, not a temple in Jerusalem. Um, it also tells us about the beautiful technique and, the, and how this painting was made and that this Jewish temple was depicted as a Gothic cathedral. Doesn't tell us at that time Jews had been evicted, their synagogues appropriated, turned into other things like that was context that, that could be relevant. We're gonna see just one of those synagogues coming up a little bit later. On the right, we have a painting from the Prado in Madrid, the expulsion of the Jews. We have here, if you can see my cursor, the Jew with his back turned to us in the foreground. He has just put a chest of gold in front of the Ferdinand and Isabella in the background here, offering them gold uh, to not expel the Jews. Everybody is rather static, except for the chief inquisitor, Turkamata here, who is in motion in a heroic pose, who has just thrown a crucifix on top of that box of gold, saying this would be blood money, don't take it. He's rather convincing the Jews are expelled. Um, but Harvard did not feel the need to tell us 
um, eight years after Jews were expelled and when their sacred spaces are being appropriated, that it might be relevant that this particular Jewish sacred space has been depicted as a cathedral. Um, this is the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, a triptych circa 1400. Um, and we're told about the gold and the technique. We're not told that these fellows hanging out over here, some of them arguably with Jew hats, are depicted in rather unflattering fashion. Here's another exception. This is at the Cloisters, the Metropolitan Museum Cloisters in Washington Heights, 1500 Spain. So the same time as that painting that we saw before at the Fog, but it tells us it must not escape notice that this relief was created just as Spain, a dominant world power, forcibly expelled its Jewish residents and compelled its Muslims to convert to Christianity. So I would say this is an exception. Okay, scene three, for those who are Seinfeld fans will know that we are now talking about naming names. Uh, okay, first thing, it would be wonderful as we would say in Hebrew, halavai, that people would pay as close attention like this to artwork in museums when they go. I would say if Domye was, was drawing today, he would probably show everybody taking selfies with the painting in the background, probably blocking it. But these are people who are looking much closer than we know people uh, look. On the left, we have a feature that I wrote in Washington Post Magazine. Um, I, I, I took a bit of time and I went around and looked at every single object on view in all the Smithsonian museums on the mall in Washington and the National Gallery. Um, that involved many hours at each museum. Natural History Museum has several thousand gems on view at any time. I looked at all of those. I made as complete a list as I could of all the objects that weren't real, facsimiles, replicas, the like, um, and things that were poorly labeled. So there is a larger issue with how museums label things. But in the course of reporting that story, I talked to one expert, Jake Barton, who referred me to research that um, one, like at best we might say people might look at, or the media uh, people looked at paintings for 17 seconds, including the label. I spend a lot of time in museums just sitting there watching how people interact with things and a lot of people don't read the labels at all. So I want us to remember that when we're looking at works that have hateful things, even if the label is correct, people might not read it. Um, people might be picking up this visual vocabulary, um, you know, subconsciously even. Um, this is this was part of that same article, the label at the National Museum for African American History and Culture. Before my story and then after my story, they noted twice that it was a reproduction. So even some of the top museums are, are sometimes taking a photograph of a painting, putting it on a wall and framing it and not necessarily warning you. Um, another offender in Philadelphia is the Barnes collection. Um, in the Barnes, you have these beautiful gold frames on the paintings with the names of the artists in these little labels that are screwed on. If you want to, um, if you want to learn more about the painting, you have to go fish a laminated card out of the back of the bench in each room, which I also observed and a lot of people don't do. If you do it, you often find that the attribution of scholarly consensus now is rather different from what Barnes thought. These three would probably, I think these would be the three oldest paintings at the Barnes on the left, the Bosch, which if that was a real Bosch, I don't know, we could be looking at a hundred million bucks maybe. I don't know, I'm not a market person, but uh, there's very few Bosches in the entire world. Jean Fouquet, if that was a real Jean Fouquet, we would probably be looking at a few million maybe. Master of the Ursula legend, I don't know, a few hundred thousand. Instead, these have all recently been, has since been downgraded to circle of or, or followers of or something. Now the Barnes has an issue. There's a, a, a unique kind of legal arrangement where they're not allowed to move things around too much, but they find a way to put a sticker on the wall that says, listen to the audio guide. They could put a fake news sticker next to the ones that are inaccurate. They could give you a caveat emptor kind of statement when you pay for your ticket saying you're gonna see things that aren't quite as good as, um, you know, as, as you might think. And museums don't always do this. So, okay, so what does this mean in terms of, of our subject? So I was at the Phillips Collection in Washington, which hails itself as the first modern art museum in the country. And I was wandering around and I ended up in front of a label like this one. I don't know if it was this painting or another one. I'd always seen Degas identified as Edgar Degas. This one, I don't have any French, so forgive me if I mispronounce, but Hilaire Germain Edgar Degas. And I thought this doesn't really tell us much more about Degas, but I wonder, I'm a little neurotic like this, if the museum is consistent. So I went and looked at every label in the museum and tried to gauge to what extent they used full names or not. So they give us Ferdinand Victor Eugene Delacroix. It's usually just Eugene Delacroix. I don't think that tells us anything new about him. Gaston Duchamp, who I think is the nephew maybe of, not, or I, he has some relation to the more famous Marcel Duchamp and he had a, a, an alias that he used which is here, they gave us that. But lo and behold, with Mark Rothko, we're not told he was born Marcus Rothkowitz. Camille Pissarro, like I mentioned before, we weren't told that he was born Jacob Abraham Camille Pissarro. 
And it turned out that the Jews, we didn't hear anything. Now, if you know something about Rothko and Pissarro's story, Rothko taught at a, a Jewish day school and certainly had thoughts on Judaism. Pissarro has lots of letters to his son. Uh, he talks about the Dreyfus affair quite a lot. Um, he got into a fight with Degas over that. His son, it was, it's a complicated story, but Pissarro's ancestry was excommunicated from the Jewish community for a marriage that the rabbi deemed uh, two people that were too closely related. So there was some issue with that when Pissarro's son was engaged to a very observant woman. Her father wanted Pissarro's son to, to convert. That doesn't really make sense to me because conversion doesn't absolve the issue that's being alleged here, but that's the history of it. And there's lots of letters about that. So there's all kinds of things we could learn about these artists if we were tipped off that they were Jewish, but the, at least for the, for the Phillips, they, they didn't inform us. I don't have proof of this, but I think that the label, there's a label at the Rothko room, which is the, one of the nicest rooms um, at any museum in the area here, I think, um, that I think now says Marcus Rothko. It's, and I like to think it was because of my story, but I don't have proof of that. So let's go back to Harvard Fog, because they had such a good record before. They just tell us Camille Pissarro. They also tell us Hilaire Germain, Edgar Degas. They tell us Pablo Ruiz Picasso, even though we usually just get Pablo Picasso everywhere. They give us Man Ray, not Emmanuel Rosicki, who also would be useful to know he's Jewish. So nothing about that. Let's go to the Dallas Museum of Art. Um, they tell us Camille Pissarro, but they tell us he was an outsider, Jewish and Danish. So that's a good tip off if we want to learn more about him. Um, this is the Des Moines Art Center. They tell us about Ben Shan, that he was born into an Orthodox Jewish family. Good. They don't tell us relevant things about Jacques Lipschitz, Morris Lewis, Chagall, Mark Rothko. I slipped my son in there on a little visit to see Mark Rothko, uh, to see the Rothko. Um, let's look at a comparison here. The label about Ben Shan on the left from Des Moines and on the right is from the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. Uh, that tells us that Sean was of Jewish descent. I think that's rather less encouraging and exciting uh, than the Des Moines one, but at least it flags something for us. Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis Institute of Art. This was a 2016, 2017 show of something called the Kunin Collection, Raphael Sawyer. The title is Self-Portrait in the Second Year of the War. We're told that it was a commitment to making art during World War II, it would be helpful to tell us that he was Jewish and made works that relate to Judaism, I would humbly submit that um, whenever you have a work that was made during World War II or a reference in a label and the artist is Jewish, if the artist identified as such, and certainly if they make Jewish work, that would be something relevant to, uh, to tell viewers. Still in Minneapolis, same show. Um, Bernard Perlin, we're not told as Jewish. We're told that there's a painting of a young boy scaling a chain like fence. You might notice the kid has a yarmulke on. That could be relevant to us. We might want to know something about his other body of work. No suggestion about that. The museum does give us El Lisitsky's name, Laser Markovitz Lisitsky, but doesn't tell us that's Jew he was Jewish in case uh, we wanted to know. Um, speaking with the same museum, Minneapolis, on the left, uh, Ruo, a crucifixion, they tell us it reveals his strong Catholic faith. I think this is a rare exception, particularly for a, a more modern artist to tell us that but the museum doesn't tell us something similar about Soutine uh, when it's talking about his carcasses of beef. The Jewish Museum in New York had a whole show um, about Soutine that waded into this and, and, and dealt with this. There's certainly something to be said. Um, the Albertina in Vienna in Austria, a museum that also might wanna uh, particular, you know, particularly be telling us about things related to World War II and the like, tells us that Soutine came from Lithuania, doesn't tell us he was Jewish, tells us about his childhood trauma, but doesn't tell us anything more. That same museum, the Albertina in uh, Austria, does tell us that Chagall was born into a working class family of Jewish origin. I don't know what the of Jewish origin means. That also seems like an interesting uh, phrasing to me. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the comments. I don't see anybody writing anything, but if I'm if I'm going too quickly, or, you know, feel free. I'll keep an eye out. I'm glad to address things as they come up. But I wasn't joking about a hundred slides, so I'm I'm trying to move. Uh, if I'm not going too quickly, we're now. Um, bouncing around quite a bit, so apologies if there's any vertigo here, but we are now in Pittsburgh at the Carnegie Museum of Art, uh, or Carnegie Museum of Art, as the director uh, there said to me once when I interviewed him. Um, here again with Ruo, we're told that this old king might represent a figure from the Old Testament. No discussion um, about the artist's faith, and, and a good body, uh, you know, a large number of pieces that Ruo makes are, are very religious pictures, I think. It's, it's, it's definitely relevant. Um, uh, back, uh, background. Um, we've now jumped, let me just move the page here. We're now in Cleveland. Cle yes. 
I'm sorry to, to jump in. Uh, there is yeah. a great question about, so what would the difference be between saying that an artist is Jewish or saying of Jewish origin? Can you say a little bit more about what concerns you? Yeah, yeah, and I see that. Thanks for that question. Yeah, I don't I don't know the answer. And I don't, I'm, I'm trying to think, I try to think a lot as a journalist of what, what somebody going into the museum who hasn't thought about this picture and about these issues might think. I think if you say somebody's Jewish or was born into a Jewish family, that that's an act of kind of more, you know, a stronger articulation. If you say someone is of Jewish origin, to me, that puts something more in the remote past. It suggests that, you know, that that's not, you know, this is something, you know, that's not necessarily as relevant. I could be wrong. And, and this, you know, this might be something that, you know, that really means the same thing to most people. But to me, like, saying that, you know, saying that someone was of Jewish origin is different. I don't, you know, I don't know, maybe others have thoughts on this and, 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 and I could be wrong. I mean, to me, like, I would like museums to point out when someone's Jewish, when it's relevant to their work and to their story. So I'll take, you know, I'll take something, even if I think it's less of a, of an a kind of powerful articulation, but, you know, but I might be wrong on this. Thank you. Okay. It looks like somebody else also agrees. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. So we are in Cleveland now where we are told not that Ruo is, um, um, not that Ruo is a, uh, you know, is, is devout himself, but that he makes deeply spiritual art. I think that's a step removed as well. Um, again, some might, uh, might uh, dispute that. And I see I just got a direct message from somebody who also seems to have some concerns about the Jewish origin compared to the others. So this is not a scientific study, but anecdotally, we have a few different perspectives. Um, let's go back to Pittsburgh, to the Carnegie Museum. Um, and here we have a label that tells us about one Samuel Rosenberg, where the one detail we're told is that he stayed in Pittsburgh uh, his whole life. I think he actually served in the, uh, so he might have left. He served in the military. Um, but we have a Post-Gazette, the local paper that has a story that tells us quite a bit about uh, Holocaust and, and, and he had a lot of Jewish work. So again, I think when we're talking about artists in Pittsburgh between the world wars, I think it's, it's an omission to not uh, to not tell us um, uh, about Jewish artists. Okay, I'm gonna go back to Minneapolis. This to me is one of the grossest labels I've ever seen in a museum uh, in my life. And this is a presentation in the temple, 1490 to 1500. And we're told what they're describing is a concept called Pidyon Haben, which is a, a redeeming of the firstborn. And we're told, according to Jewish law, the firstborn of each living thing was to be sacrificed to the Lord, but children were to be redeemed by the payment of five shekels. To me, this signals to people that Jews sacrifice or are supposed to sacrifice children. There are, I think we're all aware of, of plenty of, of uh, articulations of Jews at various points using non-Jewish babies, baking them into matzah, blood libels connected to this. The fact that this is the way that this museum sought to explain this concept of Pidyon Ben redeeming the firstborn to me is, is extremely, bizarre and troubling um and menachem this is still on the wall um this okay that's a great question um the picture on the left and the label i took probably a couple of years ago the thing on the right is from the website right now so i'm not sure if what's on the website right now is the label that's on the wall right now but we see from the label it's on view now and usually the label would be updated on the website if it was updated uh, in person um, so yes, I believe this is still, um, interestingly, you'll see, I, like, there are examples I'll point out, actually, I think the next slide, maybe even, um, I do contact museums quite a bit about labels, and sometimes they fix things, and sometimes they don't, I, I did a piece on uh, a Jewish artist, Mark Kleonsky, he has a painting at the Smithsonian that was on view at the National Portrait Gallery, where they say that certain sculptures that he painted in the background of the painting were, um, were African sculptures, and I actually tracked down, because I knew he, spent a lot of time in certain museums in New York. I tracked down, I think very convincingly exactly which sculptures he copied. And so one was African and, and several others were oceanic and I notified them and that it's been a few years, they still haven't corrected it. So it's interesting to see what happens, but back, you know, still in Cleveland, back in Cleveland here, um, I don't have the photo of the original label, but when I first saw this manuscript page on the wall here, the label said, Saul anointing David. Now Saul was a king and David was a king. Kings don't usually anoint their successor Certainly, I find it hard to imagine Saul anointing his successor when he tried to kill David, famously. So, of course, I think they meant the prophet Samuel anointing David. I wrote a piece in Religion News Service. This is a selection from it here, but I quickly did a search online about Saul anointing David. The British Library had one. I think they've since corrected it. Um, and, um, and here, Sotheby's and Christie's both had them. I contacted them to ask about it. 
These were as of a few days ago from their website. So this was a few years ago that I alerted to them and they still talk about Saul anointing David. So I think as I pointed out in this piece I wrote in the Wire Religion News Service, there is, um, um, there was, uh, you know, there's often a blind spot, I think, when it comes to Old Testament that's different um, from new. Um, I'm going to try just, oh, okay, I figured out how to go back. Okay, um, a good comment from Richard McBee. Thank you, Richard. Not aware that the presentation of the temple was a redemption of the firstborn. Um, that's a good question. Um, they, are suggest they are suggesting it was. I don't know, maybe somebody else here actually has further insight. I didn't know, but I, uh, they do point out that there are the doves that are, are brought. So yes, perhaps somebody else can with, with more. Uh, we have a few New Testament scholars on the yeah, call. I was, I was going to say there's people here, so I'm not even going to try to guess. People here will know much more than I, but if anybody knows the answer to that and wants to put it in the chat, I think that's a great question. I, I, let me, let me just say also, um, I think it's great that they're using the label to teach somebody about probably an obscure Jewish practice that people wouldn't uh, wouldn't have known. I, my problem is with how they articulate it. Um, okay, another comment on Jewish origin as a way of representing a dynamic or personal history that someone implying Jewish has transcended the person no longer identifies as a Jew. It seems to apply a distinction that's troubling. Okay, I think that's a very good observation. And it would be interesting to actually track all these things and see when it's used with with one or the other. I mean, there's this bizarre discussion, like, you know, if you go on Reddit or some of these other sites, you see these bizarre discussions about whether it's offensive to call somebody Jewish and and all. There's something about just saying Jewish that strikes some people as somehow problematic. I've never quite understood it, but I wonder also if there are feelings that people who write these labels sometimes have about what is, you know, maybe they're even trying to be more polite or more appropriate. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, uh, scene four, are Jews white? Um, okay, so first of all, there's a wide range of perspectives, it often breaks down along the political divide in the Jewish world about the Anti-Defamation League and its authoritative uh, role here. But the ADL has been tracking for a long time a rise in anti-Semitism globally and uh, nationally, and it seems to be getting uh, worse. Now, one can raise any number of questions about this. Are anti-Semitic incidents more likely to be reported than other kinds? Might that actually in some ways signify Jews are comfortable enough to report anti-Semitic. There's a, like one could have a whole talk just about this, but uh, but uh, you know there's all kinds of research on this that talks about a rise of anti-Semitism. So one would think that this should be a concern to museums, like it is uh, to everybody else. There's a very live issue that's being covered all over the place about um, whether Jews are white. I haven't seen much discussion, or I would say enough discussion, about how museums are really uniquely equipped to help us if not answer the question, at least suggest some ways for us to think about this uh, question. So let's go back to Washington, the National Gallery of Art, um, funded by all of our tax dollars. Uh, we have here a um, circa 1400 presentation of the Virgin. Okay, we're told here in the highlighted part that there's all these details that enliven and humanize a sacred event and make it accessible to us. Okay, let's look at these two fellows here on the right. Um, turning away from the action. They seem to be uh, uh, not, not the only ones doing that, but they are conspicuously doing that. They're not haloed. And we're told that these are two elderly bearded Jews disputing with each other. I would submit that's not a very positive thing to depict people doing at the time. There is certainly a reputation that you, you know, when the, just look at the way the word Talmudic is used uh, in, an, you know, to, in a derogatory way. Um, so these two figures are white, but they are, you know, we know that they're Jewish because of their um, because of the way that they're disputing, because they don't have halos and various other things. But the museum doesn't suggest to us that there's anything problematic going on here. Not only that, but this is a detail that humanizes the event and makes it uh, accessible to us. Okay, um, let's go now, sorry, just flipping the page. Um, we're going now to Athens and Greece to the Byzantine and Christian Museum. And we have the same two fellows here, depict they're depicted down here in the bottom right corner. Uh, they are disputing, but it doesn't tell us that these are Jews. It says, oh, just two old men talking to each other. Okay, that's one way to put it. Um, we're going to go now to Rome, the capital and museums describing a menorah to us. They tell us that uh, this menorah symbolizes the Jewish God as the source of light and eternal hope. I have 18 years of uh, Jewish education myself. That's new to me. I did a search online to try to find a search for this. The overwhelming majority of the sites I found were Messianic Jewish sites, which is fine, but it's, you know, that's, that's a different interpretation um, from this. I think this is a bit of a bizarre 
uh, label, so I wanted to share it with you. Um, Philadelphia Museum of Art, we have here attributed to Bosch, a mocking of Christ, and we're told that the figures look more like fiends than human beings. Some of them appear to be wearing Jewish hats. That's not pointed out to us. That would have been helpful to know. Um, this is another one of the worst labels I've ever seen in a museum. This is at the National Museum of Ancient Art in Lisbon in Portugal. And you can see the work here. And um, you can see Moses with the Ten Commandments. And you can see another fellow here. And here's what the museum tells us. Um, there's almost caricature-like features on their faces of their faces, perhaps expressing a certain prejudice towards the Jewish people at a time of deep-rooted anti-Semitism. Not expressing, perhaps expressing, and not anti-Semitism, uh, not prejudice, but a certain prejudice. I think this is uh, an amazing uh, label. So I wanted to um, bring that to your attention as well. Now we'll go to the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, a wonderful painting by Courbet, where he identifies the fellows here on the left uh, as exploiters and those making a living from death. And wouldn't you believe that amongst them is a Jew I saw in England, white, but some, you know, but something about the way he's depicted apparently is meant to tell us he's a Jew from his hat, from his, I don't know, you know, his beard, I'm not sure. But here is a Jew that is conspicuously a Jew. The Art Institute of Chicago has a painting. Uh, uh, feel very proud that they were Jewish pirates. There's a Jewish pirate here, Simon the Jew. Um, and another fellow, I had to read this label many times to figure out which one was which, but yeah, they say here, that the Jew is on the left. Uh, that's a conspicuously hooked nose to me, which we see very often in anti-Semitic. Now, I don't like I don't know anything about this artist, but it strikes me as interesting that that given that Jew is in really big letters on the title, and we're told about him in the label. Um, if this was not meant to be derogatory, I think it would be great for the museum to share that with us. There is a tradition of, you know, an anti-Semitic tradition of hooked noses meant to demonize Jews, and this is not an example. And Here's why, but to just leave it there without comment to me is is interesting. Okay, let's go back to Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland is going to come up early and often in this talk. Um, we have here a box, 12th century box. We're told that there's two Old Testament scenes, one over here, a sacrifice of Isaac, which will be particularly interesting to Richard McBee, who is watching, who paints sacrifices of Isaac quite a bit. I don't know if he knows this one. Um, another another uh, Old Testament scene over here, and in the middle, we're told that there's personifications. Christian church, the Jewish faith, the Virgin, and St. John. Anybody curious what the Jewish faith is personified as? You guessed it, blindfolded, looking away from uh, from the cross. Um, okay, so again, telling us is the personification of, of, of the Jewish faith without telling us that maybe <laughs> this, was, uh, this was associated with certain beliefs about Judaism at the time, that this is a missed opportunity. Okay. Still at Cleveland, we have the biblical Josiah here, and we're told he is not depicted as a Jew, um, but he's painted as a Christian priest sprinkling the altar. Okay, that's interesting. I wonder what that means that he's not depicted as a Jew. Let's look, he's got a hat and he's got a cloak. I found this image um, from a manuscript at the Morgan Library, note 1300 to 1310 France. So this is exactly the same time. You have the Jew here. I forget the story exactly. Someone might correct me. I believe he puts his son in the oven to burn him, maybe because the son convert, wants to convert to Christianity. Miraculously, the son doesn't burn. So lovingly, he, the dad is thrown into the, into the oven. But the hat looks very similar. The cloak looks very similar. So I don't know what this means that he does or does not look like a Jew. That's interesting to me. Um, on the left here, I took this when I was at the Uffizi a few years ago in Florence. Um, this is a Carpaccio painting. Here is the painting again at the Carpaccio show that's at the National Gallery of Art in Washington right now. I don't know what's changed, but in the left, we're told that there are several Jewish figures, the two older ones. Here, we're told that this figure in, with the white turban is Muslim, and this figure here is, Jew, is Jewish. I've talked to curators about it. I don't know how we know this is a Jew. I mean, is, they say he's dressed or looks like a Jew. I don't see anybody walking around like that who looks like a Jew, but it's fascinating that there are all these ways, evidently, that we know who is and, and isn't Jewish in these. Uh, paintings. Um, so I wanted to point that out. This is at the Kunsthistorische Museum um, in Vienna in Austria. And this is a painting I love, but this is uh, the angel guiding uh, Luke's hand, St. Luke's hand, was he draws the virgin. And there's a such thing as the elf on the shelf. This is the Moses on the shelf. You see this in a lot of paintings. Moses, he has his horns. He's pointing towards about where the second commandment would be. And I would humbly submit that what sin could be greater in an art museum than being anti-art? So the fact that you have all these paintings that show Moses saying, don't make art, and then you know, we're show, you know, the, the painting shows that the tradition has changed. This is a rather negative uh, way for Moses to be 
depicted, I think, and you'll see this in lots of paintings, if you start looking for it, uh, you'll see it quite a lot. And I, and I think it's interesting that it's usually not noted. And I think it has consequences. I mean, here's a couple of pieces from the New York Times and one from the New York Daily News. The New York Daily News tells us synagogues and mosques do not use images of any kind. I've been to synagogues and mosques that use images of many kinds, um, some of them famously. Um, we're told about the Second Commandment being a prohibition on graven images and the like. Like uh, this came up, this has come up now, and, and I'm sure people have seen coverage of, of a professor and uh, whose uh, contract was not renewed for showing an image uh, of um, uh, of Muhammad in class and, and student, Prophet Muhammad and people got, one of the students got upset and that was deemed to be uh, offensive to Islam. You'll see a lot of news stories that say Muslims don't make representational art or Muslims and Jews don't make representational art. This is not true. A lot don't, but a lot, uh, a lot do. Um, interestingly, I haven't seen any of the coverage point out that the artist who made that image who was shared was born Jewish and converted to Islam. It's an interesting interfaith uh, moment. So that could be explored more. Um, this is at the National Gallery of Art, a show of James Abbott McNeil Whistler, who was Protestant. He had a longstanding relationship. They never married. Uh, but with Joanna Hiffernan, who was um, an Irish Catholic woman, very poor, very poor family. Um, they never married, but Whistler made her executor of his will. And this whole show was designed to teach us about this uh, woman who is a model for a lot of Whistler's painting, who I think a lot of us probably didn't know her name before. There was a label about woman in white color and race. I want to read the beginning here. This selection of paintings of white women dressed in white by white artists reflects the lack of representation of people of color in mainstream mm -hmm. Victorian visual culture. I asked all the curators there, what does the dressed in white have to do with anything? I mean, I, my understanding is that people can wear different colors at any point, and that was a bizarre kind of thing. But if you keep reading, they tell us, though, that many viewers would have perceived Tiffernan as Irish based on her skin color, facial features, and distinctive reddish brown hair within the uh, biased racial hierarchy of Victorian England, the Irish were considered a separate Celtic race and subordinate to the white Anglo-Saxon. So simultaneously, this show is too white, but also, also Whistler is making a lot of paintings of somebody who wasn't seen as white enough at the time and, and because she was Catholic and Irish. So I think that's something also that was treated, I think that was treated very poorly in this show. This is a show at the National Gallery that was postponed. The show um, was in Boston. It's coming to National Gallery again soon. The director of the National Gallery said, and postponing a show of Philip Guston, born Philip Perlstein, um, that part of the problem because he painted um, a lot of, of Klansmen and, and robes and, and the like, that he had uh, appropriated images of black trauma. I think this is fascinating given that the Klan was anti-Semitic as well. Um, there were, you know, some of uh, Guston's works were destroyed um, uh, by right-wing people who thought that it was um, that it was too progressive. Like, so there's, there's a whole story to be told here. And what does that mean that, that a Jew has appropriated trauma of somebody else when that group is anti-Semitic also? It strikes me that might mean that, I don't know, is singing Rivers of Babylon appropriating Jewish trauma? Let's hope not because Rivers of Babylon was performed by the Asbury Methodist Church at a 1958 event at the National Gallery. It was also performed in 1992, sung in Latin. Um, so I think this whole question of like, you know, if appropriation goes one way and not the other way, that's that's noteworthy. Um, as the show hung in Boston, um, the Guston show, there's all kinds of warning signage and handouts and a place you can leave the show midway through in case it's too much for you. And all the show did finally note that the Klan was also anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish and it noted that the Holocaust was relevant, but these are things that were, um, you know, that were, that were really not spotlighted. Okay, um, up to scene five. Um, still don't see more comments, so I'm going to keep going. Either people are asleep or no question. Um, so this one I'm going to talk about the way we had, we talked about this a little bit so far, but the way that erasing Judaism and 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 also uh, showing anti-Semitism is addressed is 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 said by museums to be cultural diversity. So I talked before about the um, former synagogues in in Spain. This is Santa Maria La Blanca in Toledo. Um, we don't actually know what it looked like as a synagogue, but here's the way it looks right now. It is currently run by the church. You could see here um, some artwork that you see right after you come out of the space. You see an, an illustration here of Jesus. It has a quote from Song of Songs in Hebrew here. Yishakeni minashikos pio, kissing me. You know, anyway, so that's, there's there's all kind of, you know, talking about Actus, uh, no, you know, the brothership with Christians. Okay, that's who administers the site now. Okay, here's the Sergeant in Spain show at the National Gallery of Art in Washington that closed 
uh, recently. Here's a painting of Santa Maria La Blanca by Sargent. And look at the last line. Constructed under the Christian kingdom of Castile by Islamic architects for Jewish use, the synagogue now owned and preserved by the Catholic Church reflects the diversity of cultures in medieval Spain. So let's remember, Jews are expelled for anti-Semitic reasons from Spain. Their synagogues, we had, I think, uh, by some counts, more than was a dozen and a half, two dozen in, in medieval uh, synagogues in Spain that were destroyed that don't exist anymore. So Jews are expelled, their sacred spaces are stolen from them, they're reappropriated. Mind you, those were built by Islamic architects, I would think probably because Jews were not able to train in the appropriate, they were barred from the appropriate settings to learn how to become architects. But the fact that it is still owned and preserved by the Catholic Church, another way to write this label would be that the Catholic Church has refused to return it to the Jewish community. This reflects the diversity of cultures in medieval Spain. I'm, I'm struggling to find a, an equivalent example, but let's say like a sacred site, a site was stolen from uh, indigenous Americans and was, was uh, maintained by somebody else who refused to return it. But the fact that it had dual ownership in its history would reflect the diversity of cultures. I don't think we would say this anywhere else. And again, this is a label at the National Gallery of Art uh, in Washington. Um, in Baltimore, not too far away, the Walters Art Museum has a 16th century crucifixion where we're told the diversity of figures, Jewish, Turkish, German, and African, uh, reminds us of the universal message of the crucifixion. I mean, this is a negative portrayal of a Jew here with the Jew hat. I would submit also it's a rather <laughs> racist portrayal of the African figure as well, but we're told that this reflects uh, the, you know, reminds us the universal message of the scene. Again, this isn't being flagged. Um, 1537, not a great time to be a Jew in, in Germany, I don't think. If you, um, that image I showed before from the National Gallery, 1400 Siena, I think that was a particularly bad time to be a Jew in and around Siena. So this is context that we're not seeing. Okay, scene six, awkward transitions. Um, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has an enunciation. Um, and uh, 1450, and we're told the architecture here, two different kinds of architecture, symbolizes the transition from Judaism to Christianity. I think that word transition is doing a very heavy lift. We're not told that they thought at the time it was a transition from Judaism to Christianity. I would say if there was a label like this at the Bible Museum here in Washington, that would be said to be supersessionism, but this is the Metropolitan Museum. You see the same term in, uh, this is the Milwaukee Art Museum that talks about the transition here from Old Testament to New Testament. I was in Milwaukee a number of years ago. Uh, the label on the website seems to be different, so maybe they changed that, but at least when I was there, it talked about the transition. Um, I think this is a better way to put it. The St. Louis Art Museum talks about a new Christian era when Mary gave birth to Christ, or honestly, it would just be as well as saying that they thought that it was a transition. They thought that one tradition replaced the other, but for a museum to put its finger down on that, I think is, um, is surprising. Okay, flying forward. Um, mixing like oil and water. This is a Metropolitan Museum exhibit in the Breuer building after the Whitney moved out. We have a sacred, uh, early, very early 14th century uh, work, uh, Christian work alongside a sculpture by Damien Hirst, who's also exposed. If we know anything about Damien Hirst, um, well, we'll get to him in a second. Same exhibit, a juxtaposition of a 15th century sacred work alongside a Jeff Koons Buster Keaton uh, sculpture. Um, we know some of the works that Hearst made are, are rather um, uh, hateful to a lot of religious people. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, in, in interviews, uh, he has said he was Catholic until 12, but he, he doesn't believe in God now. I will just say that I've never seen a contemporary exhibit by an atheist artist where there was a thought by the curators, let's put an early 14th century religious work by a Catholic artist that talks about how people who don't believe in God are going to hell and they're immoral people. The, the kind of way that, that this happens in one direction rather than the other, I think is, you know, is, is rather noteworthy. And even putting the things not in the same vitrine side by side, I think is, um, you know, would be a different solution. Um, as people know, uh, Maurice O'Catalan, I mean, here is a, a former Pope having been crushed by a meteorite. We're told uh, over and over again, uh, you know, a curator at the Met says, not ready to call it sacrilegious. Um, if people know Piss Christ uh, by Saran, uh, this is a photograph of, of, a crucifix, of a crucifix in urine. We're told uh, here by Artsy, which is a prominent art site, that, uh, that the art, artist who's Catholic had his own interpretation of the work, but the angry public wasn't always patient enough to hear it. There's a, an, I just pulled another headline uh, that was on the Artsy website, but from our newspaper talking about protesters at the British Museum because of a partnership with BP. The tone there was not that 
that the public was too angry to listen to why the British Museum wanted to have a business partnership with BP. So that's uh, interesting. Vice tells us all sorts of things about, um, you know, about Piss Christ, how it's not a problem, it's not offensive. Um, we're told the same thing about Chris O'Feely's um, uh, depiction of the of Virgin Mary with elephant dung on it. We're also told that it's, it's only right when people are against it. And yet, when there's no controversy, museums insert controversy. This, I think, is a lovely juxtaposition of two paintings hung side by side at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. This is a depiction of Esnoga, the 17th century um, uh, kind of Portuguese Sephardic synagogue in Amsterdam. Below, we have a depiction of the portal to a, a, a Spanish church. I don't think we know exactly which one it is. And uh, yeah, we have some interesting things of note. We have Jews wearing uh, talit, the prayer shawl, some of them with top hats. We have uh, certainly more wealthy women coming out of out of this church and beggars in front. The Walters tells us both artists hint at the clash of traditional ways of life with modernity. I don't, I don't like another way to write that label is that uh, you know we have Jews who are taking time on on Sabbath and holidays to come into their synagogue in the kind of bustling metropolis that is Amsterdam in the 17th century and are worshiping in ways that their uh, people have for centuries. We have beggars who notice it outside the church because they're going to find generosity, which I think we see over here. So maybe both artists hit at the beautiful ways that people who have traditions meld those with modernity. I don't know why we had to, um, you know, we have to under, we underscore conflict when it's not there. And when conflict is obvious in the work, we're told nothing to say. here. Okay, I'm going to talk a little, fly through some slides here about Israel and then hopefully open it up to questions. Um, but I think this also fits into what I would say is the consequence of uh, of some of this. The Times has apologized many times, many times very <laughs> weeks after the previous one for publishing anti-Semitic cartoons. Why in the world do they keep publishing anti-Semitic cartoons? Hold that thought, I see a comment from Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Um, as you know, both weak and likely sincere efforts of showing respect for different cultures. Okay, yeah, thank you for um, a top five list of it's cultural. That's a great idea. I will work on that. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, okay, so why does the Times keep having to apologize for these uh, cartoons? How did they? How did they not know? Uh, other anti-Semitic car car Again, I'm not. I'm not saying these cartoons are anti-Semitic. This is a complicated question. But at least uh, you know they're. Uh, when you have publications pub uh, apologizing for it, and it's discussed in that way. Uh, NAACP. Uh, president in Philadelphia shared this, uh, Harvard Lampoon for sexualizing Anne Frank. Uh, another one here, the Berkeley student newspaper apologizes. Uh, members of Congress sharing things. Um, uh, a British political leader uh, sharing something. Some of this stuff is amplified even more with these two, you know, not beyond, um, you know, the newspapers and all. So I, I think what we're seeing here, um, and I do want to kind of wrap up and, and hopefully there'll be um, some more questions, but I think there's consequences to this when, you know, museums are the places that I think are, are we task them with, with kind of cultivating our visual literacy and explaining to us how to look and how to look well and how to notice details. And when they don't tell us that there's hateful things, in, you know, lying in plain sight, when they, when they focus on some religions and not others, when they focus on telling us about how beautiful the technique is in the painting or, you know, or, or refer to religion as being in the past rather than it being something vibrant and part of of the artist's life, I think that that there, I think we see things ending up in the newspapers. I think we see uh, celebrities talking about things, and and I think that there are uh, there are consequences. Mm -hmm.